Welcome to the virtual college expiration for all Pennsylvania students sponsored by the Pennsylvania Association for Mission College Admission Counseling and StriveScan. PACAC is a nonprofit organization comprised of more than 1200 school counselors, college admission counselors, independent educational consultants, and other professionals responsible for guiding students through the important transition from high school to post-secondary options. Thank you for joining us. A few housekeeping announcements before we get started. You can use the question and answer button on your screen to type your questions to our presenters at any time. Your camera and microphone are off so the panelists cannot see or hear you. This is just one of many different sessions happening, so be sure to check out the full schedule at PACAC.org, P-A-C-A-C.org. The presentation is being recorded and will be available within about a week at the same website, PACAC.org. Now I'd like to turn it over to our presenters. Okay, can everybody see my screen okay? It came up? Great. <laughs> Perfect. Well, my name is Caroline Ward. I am with William and Mary um, in Virginia, and I'm happy to kind of start us off by just letting everybody know we are here to discuss the public ivies of the East. And the schools included in this include Miami University, the University of Vermont, and William and Mary. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, let's see, go to the next slide uh, where we can make introductions. Randy, would you like to kind of start us off? Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Randy Miller. I am Miami's Mid-Atlantic Regional. Um, I actually live in Haverford, Pennsylvania, so potentially close to some of you. Um, so I'm based here in Haverford and I recruit on behalf of Miami in the Philadelphia suburbs, Delaware, Maryland, DC, and Virginia. Um, just a little bit of background about me. I did go to the University of Maryland for undergrad and I went to Miami for grad school. Um, so I worked in the Office of Admission in Oxford, Ohio, which is where we were located for about two years. Um, and this is now my second year as a regional based in um, just outside of Philadelphia. So thank you for joining us today. Hi guys, my name is Candace. I am the Regional Associate Director of Admissions for the University of Vermont. I'm also regional as Randy is. I'm actually based in Easton, Pennsylvania. So getting to be in the local area with you guys, but I work with all of the students in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. I'm starting my third year with the University of Vermont. And though this year looks a little bit different, I'm excited to get to share a little bit more about the university with all of you. And again, my name is Caroline Ward. I am with William and Mary. My regions include New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. Um, I live in Williamsburg, right near campus, about a seven minute commute. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, a little bit about me. I grew up going to Williamsburg, Virginia multiple times a year. So I was very familiar with William and Mary. I actually have a younger sibling attending William and Mary in her last year. And um, I actually, I did attend Miami University as my undergrad. So I'm also very familiar with Miami, um, but William & Mary is located in Williamsburg, Virginia. So we're um, right near Colonial Williamsburg. We are um, right near Bush Gardens, near Richmond, Virginia, and near not too far away from DC, uh, but we'll get into that a little later. So moving on to the next slide. So some of you may be wondering what the heck is a public IV and some of you may be familiar with this term. Um, so the whole idea behind public IVs is, and there's been a lot of talk about it in the news recently as well, um, but the whole idea is that there was this book written by Richard Mall back in the 80s um, and he basically published this list of public IVs and he coined a public IV as an institution that's giving you an Ivy League education but for a public school price. Um, so typically we see that private schools are usually tend to be more expensive than attending a public institution. Um, and so really focusing on, you know, keeping the price down as much as possible. We all know that college is pretty expensive to attend these days. Um, and so a few of us will probably talk about a few scholarship opportunities when we talk about our specific institutions. Um, but in terms of public IVs, it's really having that strong education. Um, a lot of them are liberal arts institutions, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, but really trying to keep that price competitive for all of you. So um, the other thing to take note of is there are original public IVs versus public IVs that have been added over time. Um, so we are, the, the three of us here, the three institutions that are here today are members of the original public IV. So as you can see on that book, um, you know, we are listed on there because we are the original. Um, and then of course there have been modifications made over the years, 
um, different lists that various newspapers, um, media authors, whoever it might be, may publish, um, you know, second tier public IVs or public IVs that are small or public IVs that focus on certain student populations. So we are the original public IVs. Um, and then Caroline will go through and explain a little bit more about some of the other public IVs that are out there as well. Thank you. And um, as Randy mentioned, you know, we are the originals and not just the three of us, but but a few others. And I just like to go down the list of naming the original public IVs. Um, these public IVs include William & Mary, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Miami University, the University of Michigan, the University of Virginia, the University of Vermont, the University of Texas at Austin, and then also the University of California. So keeping in mind, these were the original um, eight public IVs. And then as mentioned as well, there were more added um, over time. These are kind of what's known as runner-ups for the public IVs. So the runner-up public IVs include the University of Pittsburgh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, University of Colorado Boulder, Penn State, University of Washington, the University of South Florida, Georgia Tech, and the State University of New York, Bigham, Binghamton University, excuse me, I tripped over that name. Um, so just keeping in mind that these were the ones that were added a little bit more over time and kind of known as the runner-ups. And then the previous um, list spoke about um, those were the originals. So just moving on, Candice. Awesome, yeah, so as you can see, um, we were all designated as public IVs because we have some things in common. Um, so really these benefits of attending a public IV, um, you're gonna find high quality academics at all of these institutions. Uh, essentially, you know, being a public IV, you have the, you know, Ivy League school quality uh, academic experience. So they're gonna be academically rigorous institutions. You'll find at all of these different institutions, um, a mixture of both, you know, strong liberal arts programs as well as cutting edge STEM programs. Um, and a lot of us also, also offer, um, you know, competitive, more intimate honors colleges or honors programs, which is a great benefit um, for these schools. And then the size of these institutions as well. Most of them are medium to larger state schools. So you're gonna, you know, with that find more opportunities for different clubs and organizations, um, athletics, internship opportunities, study abroad opportunities, all of the above. Um, really coming with that size, you'll have a, a vast variety of opportunities there. And then affordability, right? A, a private school uh, education at a public school price. So um, merit scholarships are definitely available at these institutions as well as strong financial aid to make it competitive for students to attend these schools. Um, and each of us will talk a little bit more about um, what this looks like at our different schools. So why don't we turn it over to Randy to talk a little bit more in depth about Miami University. All right, so you may be wondering why we're Miami, but we're in Ohio, not Florida. We were actually founded before Florida was a state, so we do like to say that we are the original. Um, so I'm just going to work through some of these boxes just to give you kind of a quick overview of Miami. Um, and I will be happy to provide my contact information as well at the end. That way, if any of you are interested in learning more, I'm happy to chat one on one um, or I can send you a link for one of our info sessions as well. Um, so we do have over 120 majors. We have five different colleges at Miami, um, plus a department of nursing. And so our nursing department is direct entry only. Um, meaning you would need to be able to, you would need to apply as a senior out of high school to be admitted into nursing. That's the only major at Miami that you can't transfer into once you're a Miami student um, would be nursing. So it is a little bit more of a competitive program. Um, but we do have a, our College of Arts and Sciences, which is our largest college, our College of Education, Health and Society, our College of Engineering and Computing, our College of Creative Arts, which you would have to upload an audition or a portfolio online if you're interested in majoring in anything within the College of Creative Arts. So, art, music, theater, architecture, whatever it may be. Um, and then also our Farmer School of Business, which also does have a little bit of a more competitive admission process. Um, so it's super important that if you are interested in majoring in business that you list that on your application. Um, that way we can hopefully directly admit you into the business school. Um, and if not, there are a few requirements. You can complete your first year in Miami to then gain admission into your second year. In terms of sports and being involved on campus, um, we do have Division I sports. We're known for our ice hockey team. You can see that picture there um, in the bottom left of our Goggin Ice Arena, which is in the middle of campus. Um, so we have an incredible ice hockey team and also synchronized skating team. That's also where they 
um, practice and perform as well. Uh, we do have a division one football team, basketball, volleyball, baseball, the list goes on, but hockey is really where you see a lot of our school spirit. Um, we do have 17,000 undergraduate students. So I like to say that we have the opportunities of a large school with the feeling of a small school because our average class size is about 30. Um, and so Miami is the type of place where you're gonna know your faculty members, you will be doing group work. Um, if you're looking for the college environment where you can roll into class late or not show up at all or sleep through class, Miami might not be the best fit. This is really the place where you will be doing group work and you can rely on your faculty members. We are ranked within the top five in the nation for undergraduate public teaching. Um, and that really comes to our faculty members being there to support you as students. In the top right hand corner there, you can see that we do have over 600 student organizations. Um, so some of them are religious organizations, social organizations, community service related. Um, we do have club sports on campus as well. So we have over 50 club sport teams. So maybe you've played a sport your whole life and you don't necessarily want to compete at a division one level. Well, you can participate in a club sport so you still compete against other institutions in the area. Um, or intramural sports too. So maybe you've never touched a volleyball in your life and you want to try out sand volleyball. So you grab some of the people who live on your floor and you sign up for a sand volleyball team. Um, we do have Greek life on campus. Uh, about 20 to 25 percent of our students are involved in Greek life. So if that's something that you're interested in, you can join your second semester at Miami. We are known as the mother of fraternities because five fraternities were nationally founded on our campus. Um, so we do have a pretty rich tradition in that as well. As I mentioned, our five academic colleges earlier, plus our Department of Nursing, 98% um, of our students do live within a two mile radius of campus. So we are located in a really quaint college town of Oxford, Ohio. Um, and so Oxford has a cobblestone street that runs through it with different restaurants and shops and bars lining it. Um, there are hotels in Oxford, there's a grocery store, there's a hospital, there's local coffee shops. There is life in Oxford. It's definitely part of the Miami experience. Um, and so it's literally within walking distance of campus. Most of our students will walk there or ride their bikes. Um, and Miami and Oxford kind of go hand in hand with one another, um, that they are kind of a joint affiliation in a way. On the right there, you can see the average weighted GPA. That was from our class from last year. Um, and so that's just something to keep in mind if you're interested in applying to Miami. Um, and then also um, we do have a high percentage of students who are studying abroad. Um, so about half of our students are studying abroad. Um, we do have a campus in Luxembourg. That would be if you were to study there, you would study abroad in our Luxembourg Chateau. So yes, you would be taking all of your classes in a castle um, with all Miami faculty, all Miami students. That's the good news about that. Um, and then the only other thing I did want to mention about Miami is we have a lot of campus traditions. Um, and so one of which is to name your house. So if you were to drive through Oxford, um, you would see all these different houses with house names, most are completely inappropriate college humor, but one of my favorites is on the corner of Sycamore Avenue and College Avenue and they named it Sick of College. So just another fun campus tradition. So on the next slide, if we can jump to that, Caroline, um, I do want to talk about our merit scholarship grid and I think this is something that sets Miami apart from a lot of other institutions. Um, so if you do end up applying to Miami, you would apply on the Common App, that's the only application that we take. Um, so there are four things that make up a complete Miami application. First is the Common App. Second, we require one letter of recommendation. Third, we are requiring a self-reported academic record. So we'll basically ask you to go ahead and list out all the different classes that you've taken in high school, the grade that you earned, the level that it was taken at. And then based on what you submit to us, we will recalculate a GPA for you on a 4.0 weighted scale. And that's where this grade comes into play. So if you have at least a 3.5 weighted GPA and you apply to Miami by December 1st, you are guaranteed merit scholarship money at Miami. So you can see there in that right hand column, the higher your GPA, the higher the merit scholarship is that you will receive. So once again, there's no separate application for this. It's truly just if you apply to Miami by December 1st, if you have at least a 3.5 weighted GPA, you're guaranteed merit scholarship money. Um, and so I know that that was something that Candace had mentioned in terms of affordability, what makes a public IV a public IV? And then finally, the fourth thing is the $50 application fee. Um, so those are the four things that make up a complete Miami application. And then Caroline, if we can hop to the next slide here, um, I just wanna talk a little bit about return on investment. Some of you may have heard of ROI. Um, and so basically, you know, you spend all this time and money and effort applying to colleges, in college, 
What happens afterwards? Um, so 96% of our students who graduated from the class of 2019, and this is the same stat from, as you can see, the class of 2018, um, were either employed or going to graduate school within six months of graduation. So our students are getting hired, they're getting out there. Um, we have an amazing career services department who is ready to help. Um, we have internship fairs throughout the year. We have large career fairs. So that means that only 4% of our students within six months didn't necessarily know what they were going to be doing after college. Um, so it's a really high number. I definitely encourage you to look at other institutions, um, job placement and grad school placement rates as well, um, because you wanna make sure that after you spend all that time in college that you are going on to the right path afterwards. So thank you, Caroline. Um, if any of you do have questions about Miami, feel free to throw them in the chat and we will get to them after. All right, guys, so I'm back to tell you a little bit more about the University of Vermont. Um, University of Vermont, or UVM, was founded in 1791. So we're actually the fifth oldest college in New England. Uh, so we're definitely old, but we're also new, you know, constantly renewing our programs as well as our facilities to kind of keep up with the ever-changing world around us. And I also think we're a nice medium size. We're both big and small. Um, you know, 10,000 undergraduate students is big for a liberal arts, other liberal arts colleges, but it's also small compared to many other national like research universities. So we're kind of right in that sweet spot. We have a 16 to one student faculty ratio. So our students are able to get kind of that more intimate academic setting um, in the classroom, but then also have the opportunities and resources of a large school. You might notice there too that the ratio of our in-state to out-of-state students is probably a little unusual for a state school. Um, Vermont's a small state with a smaller population, so 73% of our students do come from outside the state of Vermont, um, both across the country and across the world. And we offer over 100 different majors at UVM, including 40 accelerated master's degree programs. But don't worry, those aren't anything you have to worry about kind of applying uh, as a first year student. Our majors really kind of, um, you know, run the span, you see the different schools and colleges listed there. Um, everything from agriculture and life sciences, our traditional um, College of Arts and Sciences, which is our largest. We also have education and social services, engineering and mathematical sciences, nursing and health sciences, as well as our Grossman School of Business and our Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources. I know there's a ton of different options out there, and if you are unsure of what you want to study, don't worry. Undecided is, I think, our most popular major when it comes to the application. We allow students to apply as undecided to every um, of those schools and colleges except for nursing or business. So if you're thinking nursing or business, you definitely want to apply as your first choice into one of those programs and start there because it's much easier to transfer out later um, than it is to try to transfer in later. We also do have an honors college and we will automatically consider all admitted students for an invitation to join our honors college. So there's no additional application that you need to do. Right, next slide, Caroline. Awesome. So just want to highlight a couple of things um, that I think make UVM really special. Um, speaking of, you know, nursing and health sciences, as I mentioned before, we do have a hospital on campus. It is the University of Vermont Medical Center. We do have a medical school as well. Um, so this is a really great opportunity for our students to be getting um, some experiential learning in, um, in that setting, in their field. Maybe it's our nursing students doing clinicals or um, you know, being involved in our pre-med enhancement program, shadowing a doctor in the hospital. Um, doing research in the labs is another great way to gain some experience outside of the classroom. We also try to take advantage of our location in beautiful northern Vermont uh, to get our students outside of the classroom into the environment. We have 14 different natural sites that we manage to give students a lot of uh, experience, whether it's on Lake Champlain or at the top of Mount Mansfield. We also have more than 500 different study abroad opportunities available to our students, whether that's um, you know, more of a formal traditional semester exchange program or a short term trip or just a, a you know, semester with UVM faculty. There are so many different choices. So we really want to get you outside of the classroom as much as possible to be gaining that experience. And 92% of our students are doing some sort of experiential learning. At UVM, you do have to live on campus at least two years, and we have all of our students organized into different learning communities. And these are essentially themed dorms. They're really big, broad topics that you select on your housing application, which you're interested in. I think all students got within their top three choice this year, so that was awesome. Uh, really big, broad topics ranging from a wellness environment, outdoor experience, innovation and entrepreneurship, arts and creativity, really a kind of a whole host of lists here. And it's nice, um, I think, following this model because uh, you get to know coming in that you are living with other people who have a similar interest to you and it kind of helps to break the ice, 
allow you to start building your community and your home away from home at the university. One of my other favorite things to mention is that uh, the food is great at UVM. 20% of the food that we serve in our dining halls is local. Um, so whether that's maple syrup or the ice cream that we serve in the dairy barn that's made from the milk from our very own cows at our dairy farm, uh, you can't get too much more local than that. Um, and then a little bit about the, the ROI, as Brandy mentioned, 93% of our students go on to, uh, to be employed or in graduate school within six months of graduation. And this helps, um, we have all of our students doing this by following our four-year pathway to success, which is really just an opportunity for all students to kind of be checking in with an advisor, stay on track, make sure they're building their resume, getting all this experience and really setting themselves up to graduate. So they go on to join our really successful alumni network. All right, next slide, Caroline. Okay, so to talk a little bit about the application process and the admissions profile, um, at the University of Vermont, we take both the Common App and the Coalition App, so it's really up to you which application you prefer to send in. We have Early Action, which has a November 1st deadline, and we also have Regular Decision, which has a January 15th deadline. Uh, doesn't matter which application that you submit or which timeline that you apply on, all students are reviewed the same way and have all the same requirements for admission. Uh, we do a holistic application review, meaning we're taking into consideration all of the different parts of your application um, because you are all of these different parts, right? You're not just a GPA or just a test score or anything like that. So we're really considering each student's unique background and preparation um, in consideration for admission. We do require your high school transcript, which um, you see there the average GPA of our applicants is about a 3.7 on a 4.0 scale. And this year we are test optional. So it's really up to you if you have test scores and you're happy with them, you think they reflect well on you as a student, you're welcome to submit them for consideration in your application, um, but you don't have to submit them at all. Um, and then we also will require one letter of recommendation, which we get through your materials. Um, we'll read your essay, see your activities, kind of consider you, like I said, your whole background. We do also have optional supplemental essay questions, which I would always suggest, uh, you know, completing one of them. There, there's five different prompts and they're really fun kind of broad questions that allow us to see something or learn something else about you that we don't see in the rest of your application. So that could be, you know, why you want to come to UVM or it could be which Ben and Jerry's ice cream flavor are you and why. Um, so I know they're optional, but we always recommend doing them because again, it's a, it's a great creative way to show us a little bit more about you, who you are. All students will also be considered for merit scholarship and for our out of state students, those range up to $20,000 per year. And then if you submit your FAFSA, you'll be considered for um, other financial aid. And again, all students are considered for an application to join the Honors College, or an invitation to join the Honors College. There is no application for either of those. So we'll try to keep it all pretty simple for you. At this time, um, UVM is still closed for external visitors. We don't have any on-campus programming. Um, and this is because our students are on campus and they're being really you know, successful keeping, um, you know, the whole school running right now. So we're trying to de-densify those spaces as much as possible to help them out. Um, but we do have a really robust um, offering of virtual different presentations and uh, you know, panels and workshops and all kinds of different stuff this year that you can find at uvm.edu slash visit. If you do have any additional questions, please feel free to go ahead and start putting your questions in the chat and we'll definitely get to them after we hear a little bit more about William and Mary. Thank you, Candace. Um, so yes, I just wanted to share, oh, sorry. There we go. I just want to share a little bit about William & Mary. So William & Mary is located in Williamsburg, Virginia. We are the second oldest college in the United States. We were chartered in 1693, so we're a little old. We have quite a history. Um, so even though we're the second oldest college in the United States, we have a lot of firsts. We have the first honor code, the first honor society, the first law school, the first modern languages department, and the list goes on. We also have the oldest academic building still in use in the United States today. That's our Wren building, and it's located basically right in the heart of, of between campus and between Colonial Williamsburg. So really, really neat um, building and actually a little, a little tradition of our students is to get a class in the Wren building at least once before they graduate. Um, and then a little bit about the area. We are right next to Colonial Williamsburg. And if any of you have visited CW before, there's a lot of history there, a lot of fun things to do. It is the largest living history museum in the, in the, in the world, really. Um, and it's really, really neat to have right next door. Students of William & Mary do get free annual passes to Colonial Williamsburg for being students of William & Mary. 
the different events that go on just in the colonial area alone. Uh, we have a farmer's market every Saturday morning that our students like to enjoy. There are lots of restaurants and shopping in Merchant Square, which is right at the tip of Colonial Williamsburg. And then of course there are like the taverns and shops and everything in the actual colonial area. Um, so a lot to do right next door. We also are 10 minutes away from Bush Gardens, which is our Europe themed amusement park. And actually, Bush Gardens uh, discounts its tickets to William and Mary students uh, one day a year, lands on a Friday in the fall near Halloween time, so they have their Halloween Hello Scream decor up. Um, so that's really fun for students to enjoy, and since it falls on a Friday, they really get to go with their friends and enjoy the whole park and the good food at Bush Gardens. We're also about 10 minutes from an outlet mall, so if you need to do some shopping, that's not too far away. We have Yorktown Beach about 20 minutes from campus. Virginia Beach is about an hour away from campus, and we also have Richmond about an hour away from campus. Now we are two and a half hours from Washington DC and Washington DC holds a special place in our hearts because we do have a campus in DC. We have what's called our study in DC program where you can study in Washington DC and um, basically learn and take William Mary classes at our campus in DC. You would also live in apartments uh, that William and Mary provides and I have toured both the classrooms and the apartments and they are pretty spectacular. Now with the study in DC program the the classes range each each term each semester each summer um, and they welcome all majors to apply so any major can apply of course it's usually pretty popular but, uh, among government majors uh, but all majors can apply to the study in dc program now if you choose the summer or semester term with the study in dc program you can also intern in the city as well so lots of opportunities right nearby in terms of getting back to campus and sharing a little more about our student body and, and student life and campus life, um, we have a little over 6,300 undergraduate students, so we're a small to medium sized school. We're very well known for our research opportunities. About 80% of undergraduates conduct research with a faculty member by the time they graduate, and a quarter of those, uh, those students are published. So you can certainly be a published researcher by the time you graduate William & Mary. Now research is not just in the sciences, not just in the STEM areas. I know when I hear research, I do think science and labs, but it can also be in the humanities, the arts, the social sciences, whatever area you're interested in, you can pursue research in. We are also very strong in study abroad. About 55% of our students study abroad at William & Mary. Now this year was a little bit different, um, but typical year about 55%. I studied abroad twice in my undergraduate career and I absolutely loved it. So I always love talking about study abroad to prospective students. We do have 40 specific William & Mary study abroad programs uh, through William & Mary, but if you don't find the perfect for program for you, then you can look at other institutions, other colleges and universities and look at their study abroad programs and find the perfect program for you and have that credit transfer. You would just work with our fantastic Reef Center uh, Global Education Office and have that credit transfer. Now, William & Mary students can study during a summer, study abroad during a semester, or spring or winter break terms, or even a year long term. Now, we also offer a unique, exciting joint degree program with the University of St. Andrews. I always like to highlight this program because it is very unique um, and a special program. And it's one of our many offerings. So just keep in mind, you could study abroad anywhere in the world. Um, but with this joint degree program, what it means is if you apply into the program and you get into the program, you would spend two years at William & Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, and two years in Scotland at the University of St. Andrews. Now, if you apply to the program through William & Mary, you would spend your first year at William & Mary, second year at St. Andrews, and then you would pick your third and fourth years where to spend those. So it kind of depends on where you want to graduate. Now, within this program, there are only six majors offered. The six majors include English, History, Classical Studies, Film and Media Studies, International Relations, and Economics. So I hope that's the six. Um, I hope that equals six, uh, but those are the majors offered within the program. Now, aside from the small cohort that is in the St. Andrews Joint Degree Program, which equals about 25 to 30 students per year, aside from those students, all other students that come into William & Mary come in undeclared. With that Joint Degree Program, you have to know your major when you apply into that program. With William & Mary, just in general, if you're just applying to William & Mary, you're coming in undeclared, and you actually don't declare a major until around second semester of sophomore year. So you have to about two years to take a variety of different classes and then discover your, your new interest or continue on your interest in a certain major from there, you would just declare that major with your advisor. Now, in terms of student to faculty ratio, as you can see, it's 11 to 1. Our students are, are very close to the community as our faculty with our students and faculty are very accessible. They always like to say, yes, we have office hours, but we also are available basically whenever students have questions or need us. 
And then I also want to talk a little bit about campus life, but I moved on to facts and figures just um, to show you a brief glimpse of some um, facts and figures from our previous class. But in terms of campus life at William & Mary, we have nearly 500 clubs and organizations. So that's quite a lot considering our student body size. Some clubs I like to mention include our Cheese Club, our Salsa Dancing Club, our Salsa Club, our Guacamole Club. There are, there are a lot of food clubs at William & Mary. And we also have a Bird Club, which has a lot of bird watching involved in it, four Harry Potter Clubs, and many more. In terms of sports, we have 16 varsity sports teams at William & Mary. We are a Division I school. We also have 45 club sports and many, many intramural games on the weekends. So you can certainly get involved in sports at William & Mary. So that's just a brief uh, snapshot of campus life, but happy to, to answer any questions pertaining to that um, in the future. But I wanna also delve into the application process at William Mary just a bit. You can apply to William Mary either through the common application or the coalition application. There are three different decision deadlines. There's early decision one due November 1st, early decision two due January 1st, and regular decision due January 1st. Early decision one and early decision two are binding. So if you apply ED1 or ED2 to William and Mary and you get into William and Mary, you do have to come to William and Mary. So that's really exciting. It's not scary, right? Um, really exciting. But of course, if you wanna to apply to a bunch of different schools, find out your decisions and make your choice from there, you can certainly apply regular decision. One thing I really do want to point out about our application process that's different this year and will be for the next three years is that we are test optional. So certainly if you take the SAT or ACT and do really well, feel free to submit your score to, to add to your application. If you take it and don't do very well, then feel free not to submit your score to add to your application. Or if you just don't have the opportunity to take a test, that's okay. That's okay. It does not negatively impact your application um, to you know, leave it blank to be test optional. Um, so just keep that in mind uh, with William Mary for the next three years. Then I want to go ahead and pass it on to begin our Q&A. All right, so um, now's the time that we can answer any of the questions that you guys might have about any of our institutions or the college process. Uh, so please utilize that Q&A uh, feature. Please put your questions in. If you do want to direct your question to a specific school, uh, just make sure you, you let us know which school, but otherwise, um, if they're really general, I think we'll all take a turn in answering. Uh, we do have one question already in the chat, which is great. Um, are test scores required to be considered for any scholarships offered? Um, I'll go first. Uh, at UVM this year, we are test optional, so you do not need to submit test scores in order to be considered for any scholarships. Um, all of our students will be considered for merit scholarship regardless of their test scores. At Miami, um, we are test optional this year. Um, and so the way that it works is if you do submit a test score, um, what we will do is basically calculate two internal merit scholarship offers for you. So one will be solely based on your GPA, because you saw that merit scholarship grid before, and the other will be based on your GPA and your test score. Um, whichever one is higher, whichever offer is higher is what we'll end up offering you. Um, and so it can help, you know, in terms of getting a higher merit scholarship offer, but it won't hurt when it comes to merit scholarship. So it's completely up to you if you do want to submit your test score. And at William and Mary, we're test optional this year as well. Um, and it, it does not um, impact your merit scholarship consideration. Um, you're just automatically considered when you apply to William and Mary, uh, when we review you and we want to move you along in that process to be considered for one of our three merit scholarships. Okay, great. Uh, we did have another question come in. Um, are freshmen allowed research opportunities um, at the University of Vermont? Absolutely. Um, maybe not right away first semester of your freshman year because you do want to have that time to come in and get acclimated, um, you know, get the lay of the land, if you will. But we definitely um, keep these opportunities open for all of our students. Um, at UVM, we have a very small graduate student population. So you're not, it's, you know, these opportunities are there for undergraduate students. We actually have an office called the FOUR office, which stands for Fellowships, Opportunities, and Undergraduate Research. So I would definitely um, encourage you to check out their website to see what, what was out there. Randy, how about at Miami? So at Miami, we have something called the First Year Research Experience. Um, so that's definitely something you can look up online to find out more about if you're interested. But we basically say that research can start from day one if you want it to. Um, and so if you are interested in conducting research, um, you are able to do so. There is a two semester commitment um, that we do ask you to give. And so that's part of the program as well. Um, and so not a ton of students participate in it during their first year just because 
it's a big transition to college, you're adapting, you're getting used to, used to your new living and learning environment, um, but it is there for students who are interested in pursuing research opportunities from the start. And at William and Mary, you can absolutely get started on research right at the beginning of your freshman year. We have a fantastic Charles Center that can help you apply for a scholarship to cover any funding you need for your research. They can also kind of introduce you to methods and research. And then you'll just, you'll also learn methods and research in your classes, depending on what classes you choose. Um, but absolutely, and actually one of our merit scholarships provides a research stipend uh, for freshman students to do a freshman seminar. They're focused on research their freshman year right from the beginning. Awesome. Uh, guys, please feel free to ask us anything. Um, I've got a couple questions prepared just in case you guys don't want to take the time to type everything out. So please, um, you know, get those questions in for us. But um, my question to the, the panel would be, what is um, one of your favorite traditions on campus? And we'll have Randy go first and I'll, I'll go last. Sure. So I mentioned the house name. So, um, you know, naming your house if you live in Oxford. Another one is there's a building on our campus called Upham Hall. And within Upham Hall is Upham Arch. And it's been said that if you kiss another Miami student under Upham Arch at midnight, that you will get married. Um, and two Miami students getting married become Miami mergers. And our alumni relations office sends 14,000 Valentine's Day cards out every year to Miami mergers. So just kind of a fun campus tradition. I think the national average, like the national percentage of alumni getting married is about 4%. At Miami, it's 16%. So you never know who you might be sitting next to in that first week of classes. And at William & Mary, my favorite tradition would have to be uh, something called Yule Log. This happens in mid-December time and it happens in the evening, so it's all dark and chilly outside. And the whole community gathers in our inner, inner Wren courtyard, so the side of the Wren building facing our sunken garden. And because it's dark outside, there are fires around the Wren building going. There's a light show against the bricks of green and gold, our school colors. And then throughout the evening, different acapella groups of William & Mary perform holiday songs. Different group, uh, student groups go up on stage to talk about the different holidays being celebrated around the world. And then the president of the university reads a holiday story and then begins um, a sing-along and encourages everybody to join in. Last year, she had everybody join in Frozen to Let It Go, which was really exciting. And then toward the end of the evening, hot cider and cookies are passed around and then people get to throw sprigs of holly onto the brand new U-log for good luck and also kind of looking forward to the new year with optimism and leaving their worries behind them. So you see a lot of students enjoy this tradition because it's happening during finals week, so they want all the luck they can get. Um, but it's, it's a really, really fantastic tradition. And it doesn't snow often in Williamsburg. We do get all four seasons and it doesn't snow often, but once in a great while, it'll snow around Yule Log and it'll just be like a nice dusting of snow. Um, so it's all nice and cozy in winter wonderland, basically, uh, during Yule Log. That's awesome. Um, one of my favorite traditions at UVM takes place at the very beginning of the year when all the students come back to campus. Um, and it is a candlelight ceremony that takes place on our university green where the whole community comes together um, and makes the pledge or renews their pledge to uphold what we call our common ground. And our common ground are a set of values that we uh, live by in kind of everything that we do at UVM. So they are respect, integrity, innovation, openness, justice, and responsibility. So it's kind of a cool, I always get like goosebumps when I think about it, like activity for everyone to come together with the candles, like all together on the lawn, um, just really shows the sense of community at UVM that everyone comes together to uphold it. these values, our common ground. Um, we've got another question. Can freshmen have cars on campus? That's always a question that we get asked at, um, I think a lot of our visits and college fairs and stuff. Um, at UVM, freshmen cannot have cars on campus. Uh, we are in a city, so parking is a little bit more limited, but it also kind of goes to, to us being a green university, being more sustainability and trying to reduce our carbon footprint. How about at Miami? So at Miami, you can have a car on campus because you're more than 200 miles away. I will let you know right now, it will not be parked in a special VIP spot driveway right outside of your residence hall. Um, it would probably be a little bit next to campus or maybe down by um, the Miami police station. We have a substation, so um, it will not be necessarily right there for your use every second you want to get out. But Oxford is really accessible in terms of it being walkable. Um, so I personally don't think it's necessary. Caroline, maybe you even want to jump in and share your experience if you want in terms of 
um, having a friend that had a car on campus or if you did, but I don't think it's necessary. Um, I think, you know, if you want to in order to get home for breaks and stuff like that, it can be helpful, but for day to day use, you probably don't need one. I absolutely agree with that. My experience at Miami, I did not have a car uh, all four years and my last year I lived off campus in an apartment and I just took the bus. I just took, it was always, you know, on time and um, always took me to campus and, and like Randy mentioned, you're going to be close enough that it is walkable, but in certain weather climates, if you want to take the bus, very easy to do so. Um, the bus stops very consistently on different stops around campus. I did have a friend who had her car all four years, including freshman year, and she did have a park near the police station. And we did have to walk really far. And so she ended up only using it once in a while on the weekends. So, you know, all during the week, she just either used the bus or just walked around. So in reality, she kind of, I think, regretted bringing her car because she didn't use it as much. And by not using her car as much, she really did um, bond with people just kind of walking around Oxford, walking around campus. So I'd recommend the same thing. Um, if you want your car, kind of bring it later on, um, either when you live off campus or maybe uh, if you do, live somewhere with, with greater parking. But in terms of William & Mary, uh, the William & Mary, uh, we have, oh gosh, yes. Okay, so you can't bring a car your first two years. Um, your first two years, you are required to live on campus at William & Mary, and you can't have a car, um, but that's okay. It's very easy to get around. It's a very walkable campus from one corner to the opposite corner. It's like 15 to 20 minute walk, um, so it's very easy to get around. We're also very bike friendly, so a lot of bike lanes. There is a bus system that goes around Williamsburg itself that students can get on for free with their ID card, and it does have certain stops around campus. So very easy to get around. Many of our students carpool, um, but you can't have a car those first two years, but I haven't really heard students ever complain about that. Awesome. Well, it looks like we have just a couple more minutes. Um, so I think the last question is a great one just to, um, you know, what piece of advice do you have for seniors who are kind of navigating the process this year, which is a little bit different than previous years? And then Randy, you want to go first? Sure. So I would say use us. We are your go-to. Um, we are here to work with you, not against you. So please feel free to reach out to us at any point. Um, and that's my advice for even, you know, juniors, sophomores, whoever you are, um, please feel free to ask us. Our websites are really confusing. Our websites are all different. We all have different admission requirements. Um, you know, it might make sense for if you're applying to Miami that you list a certain major, whereas if for William & Mary, you know, it doesn't matter. So um, please use us, reach out to us. We are here ready to answer your questions. Um, don't feel like any of your questions are ridiculous or silly. Um, trust me, we've heard every single question in the book. Um, so please just use us as your resource and don't be afraid of us because we are here to help you. And um, Caroline, speaking of which, do you want to flip real quick to our contact slide? I was going to say the same thing. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So here's our contact information should you guys need it. But Caroline, what's your advice for this year's group? Yeah. I mean, Randy had, had great advice and I absolutely agree with that. Um, another piece of advice would have to be, please feel free to check out our visit opportunities on our website. Um, hopefully it's easy to access on each of our websites, um, but as I'm sure the others will concur, we have virtual visit opportunities and these are great ways to not only show demonstrated interest if that's important to the schools you're looking into, but they are a great way to get a sense and a feel of the campus community. We know that many of you are home. We know that many of you might be unable to visit the campus in person. So the virtual visit opportunities are what really help you get that sense of, of that community. It might have, you know, ways to reach out to students. It might have a virtual tour. It might have, um, you know, reach out to your dean or counselor at that university. So please, please, please look into those. Um, they are worth it. And it might be a little time, but you really do get a sense of, of that, of what could become your, your second home away from home. Awesome. Yeah, I would definitely echo what both Randy and Caroline said. Those is usually my two pieces of advice as well. Um, I would say for this year, um, for my seniors especially who are applying, um, the comment of the, the applications do give you an opportunity to kind of share how COVID has impacted you. Um, keep in mind that we're, we've all been experiencing the same thing, that we haven't gotten to do a lot of different things this year. Um, but I would really be interested in learning what you did do. Like, yeah, we couldn't, you couldn't play a spring sport, you couldn't, um, you know, do whatever it is you had planned, but what did you get to do? Um, and I think that's going to show a lot of student character and that will be important in our review to get to know you a little bit better. 
Awesome. Well, we thank you guys so much for joining us uh, today. Please, again, if you want to take a screenshot of our contact information or take a picture with your phone, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at all. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. When you close this window, there will be a quick four question survey that we'd ask that you complete if possible. Um, additionally, as a reminder, there are many sessions being hosted. Please be sure to sign up for additional sessions at PACAC.org. And in about a week, you'll be able to find this session's recording as well as other ones, again, at PACAC.org. Thank you to the presenters. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day.